Thank you so much for that wonderful musical number. It's amazing to hear the prophecies associated with this university put to song that way. That's absolutely amazing. So we're grateful to have President Henry B. Eyring with us today. I want to introduce him a little bit. He was named the second counselor in the first presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on January 14th, 2018. Previously, he had served as the first counselor in the first presidency to President Thomas S. Monson and second counselor in the first presidency to President Gordon B. Hinckley, going back to 2007. He was named a, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles on April 1st, 1995, having served as a member of the 70s since October 3rd of 1992. President Eyring completed his Bachelor of Science degree in Physics at the University of Utah and both a Master's degree and a Doctoral degree of Business Administration at Harvard University. He began his career in education at Stanford University in the faculty of the Graduate School of Business in 1962, 60 years ago. (laughs) (laughs) Long time. In 1971, President Eyring was named the president of Ricks College in Rexburg, Idaho, now known as BYU-Idaho. That marked the beginning of more than 50 years of service in the church educational system, including two terms as the commissioner and many years as a member of the board of trustees and and as officer on the board of trustees. We thank him for the wonderful influence he's had on education in the church over these many decades and the many, many students and and families and communities that have been impacted as a result. President Eyring is married to the former Kathleen Johnson and they're the parents of four sons and two daughters. We're also grateful to have Elder Clark G. Gilbert with us today. Elder Gilbert was sustained as a General Authority 70 on April 3rd, 2021. He currently serves as the Commissioner of the Church Educational System. He's earned a bachelor's degree in international relations from BYU in 1994, and then went on to earn a master's degree in Asian studies from Stanford University, and a doctor of business administration degree from Harvard in 2001. Elder Gilbert has worked in education for more than 20 years, including time as an assistant professor at Harvard University, and associate academic vice president of Brigham Young University at Idaho, president of BYU-Idaho, and president of BYU Pathway Worldwide. He and his wife, Christine, are the parents of eight children. We're grateful to have them both with with us today and again, thank them for all the service that they've provided to the church educational system and to all of us. So as you can see, things look a little bit different this morning. Um, And I wanna outline our, our format for the devotional today. We've asked a few students from our Holokai Foundations course to join us on stage. These are mentors in that course. Um, We have Charlene, Charlene Lee, a junior from Canto Rizal, Philippines, majoring in English education, and she served in the Baguio Philippines mission. We have Luke Sean de la Cruz. Uh, He's a senior from San Diego, California, majoring in business business management and finance. He served in the Micronesia Guam mission. And Foloi Fido, a senior from Samoa, Apia, Samoa, majoring in social work. Uh, Foloi served in the Philippines Manila mission. So they have come up with a few questions, and President Eyring and Elder Gilbert and I are going to have some discussion with them as we try to address those questions. After we go through those questions, I will kind of wrap things up, announce the balance of the meeting and President Eyring will address us to close things out. So, shall we get started? You ready for this? <laughs> Our first question is gonna come from Charlene. Thank you so much, President Kawe. President Eyring, um, in your ministry as a special witness of Jesus Christ, and in working with President Russell M. Nelson, what patterns of ministering have you observed and developed that reflect how Christ ministered when he was here on earth? And how can we apply this pattern in our responsibility to establish peace internationally? 
<laughs> Sorry. It's a long, long question. <laughs> <coughs> well, let's begin. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there's so many parts to that, I think we better... Uh, I think let's start with, the, with the, the story, though, that his suggestion is that what have I learned from being uh, a witness, and particularly in serving with President Nelson? Uh, what does it mean to be min a minister? I think the best thing I can say is that uh, Probably what I've learned about ministering the way the Savior does is uh, it's, he does it with a kind of love, it, 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 which he shows in the most mundane ways. Uh, everything he does, as nearly as I can tell, is always ministering with anybody he's with. And so, as a, I, w I would say he, he doesn't preach. He acts in a way like the Savior. A little, a tiny example, for instance, is uh, when anyone comes in to see us in the First Presidency, whoever they are, it's people from it, it was a delegation from China recently. It was, uh, it was, uh, it's people who work in the church. <laughs> when, when they come in the room, he calls all of them by name. And I can't believe it. You know, uh, he, he, in fact, I was worried when I came here. Uh, I wanted to know the names of your children because <laughs> I was thinking that's how he ministers. It's, it, it's, it's interesting. He, uh, it, it, it's somehow, the love of the Savior is such in him that individuals, he, 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 they, he cares about them so much as if the pure love of Christ is the way he just deals with people. And so, in, in, and again, I'm just, this is one, your question is so, Profound, but I'll just start with that one at, at least. As nearly as I can tell, to minister like the Savior, for instance, I, I know the Savior knows my name. <laughs> I, I have that faith partly by watching the, the prophet of God. Uh, in, in fact, when someone comes in to see us, if he's someone he saw 20 years ago in some place, he'll say, How's Charlene, one of the children of, of the person? He, uh, there's a kind of, wh whatever the ministering is, that the pure love of Christ, uh, there's a kind of caring for the individual that I think uh, I'm working on anyway. That's why I'm answering your question, and th th you're going to hear some better answers from, <laughs> from these other brethren, because that's a huge question, is what in the world does it mean to minister as a, as, a, as a servant of Jesus Christ as much as you can the way he does. There's so many, well, it'll be fun to listen to these brothers. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll just start this observation President Eyring has, Charlene, of how President Nelson knows the individual. Um, it really is remarkable. We, we meet every month with all the presidents. President Nelson loves your president, by the way. And he always, when, when the meeting ends, he comes and he greets each one of the presidents. He looks them in the eye and he shakes their hand. And when we were called, can you imagine you get a call from the secretary of the pre president of the church and he says, President Nelson would like to meet with you and your wife. And this was when we were called as a general authority. And as he walked up to us, and we were nervous and anxious and lots of trepidation, and he just looked at us and he said, oh, how I love this couple. <laughs> and it just put us to rest, and we were calm. And then he extended the calling, and it wasn't within minutes. He asked about each one of our children by name, just like President Eyring said. 
including our youngest, how's Claire? He said, you know, by name. And he wasn't looking off of notes. And uh, he really does minister to the one. And we, we have a prophet for the world. But in his interactions, they're always individualized and tender. And I, I, we, we have this from, from President Eyring. I When we were in Rexburg, the first time we were there twice, our home burned to the ground. It was a fire just before we moved in, and it burned completely to the ground. President Eyring was there for a visit to the university, and on a Sunday, we got a knock on our door, and he just wanted to check on me and my wife and our kids, ask how we were doing with the fire and everything that had happened. So this, you know, prophets and apostles, they... They preach to the world, but they minister to the one. Thank you. Yeah, and my thoughts would be, I love what she said, is that what President Eyring said, that Christ, he knows that Jesus Christ knows his name. And, you know, President Nelson, President Eyring, all of our apostles have been charged to represent and testify of the Savior all the time. That's a heavy burden, I'm sure. Uh, but there's this model for us to understand yeah. that if we are going to minister like Christ, we have to care for, listen to, understand the people around us to, to get as close to that perfect understanding of others that, that Christ has. Right? So for me, that's, the, that's what I see in those interactions is this clear knowledge that in order to minister like Christ, we have to learn to love and understand and listen yeah. to those that we're trying to minister to. You know, her question that's got me, I, I'm re realizing we, we could stay all day on this one. Uh, I, I'm trying to say how does the Savior, uh, you know, how does the Savior and being his disciple lead to this thing that we're talking about? This is the terribly personal caring for somebody as if they're very, very important. I, I, by the way, I'm trying to figure it out myself as to what is it that, that, that has that of, what is there about my testimony of Jesus Christ that leads to that kindness? And you know, I think, maybe this is just me, it'd be interesting to see if, and, they'll probably, and you'll probably correct us too, because <laughs> you, you, you're working on this too. But I, I think that the thing that President Nelson has talked about of repenting daily really has had an effect on me uh, because he seems to suggest that I need to be thinking of the Savior's sacrifice. And, and, and in, in an interesting sort of a way, I think this business of, of as, a, as a disciple of Jesus Christ being terribly concerned with people is you have a feeling of, of their suffering or whatever the problems, they, and you've got that by having thought lots about the Savior. And it, it seems, that, I don't know, it's an odd combination, but nearly as I can tell, when I am most like President Nelson is in times when I'm feeling fairly repentant and re thinking about uh, how <laughs> how the Savior is so nice to me despite what I'm really like. <laughs> that is, uh, he's, uh, that he pays the price of the sins of everybody, <laughs> including the ones, that t every, the ones that hate him, but that he has that c yeah. capacity. Uh, and it, it's perhaps <coughs> thinking about that. Now, again, I... I, I I can't speak for President Nelson because I don't know how he get, I don't know how he's got to where he is, but at, le at least for me, when I come closest, uh, it, when I met some people here today and they told me the stories of their lives, with with a little bit of the difficulties that they faced, I think I was a little bit feeling how the Savior has been feeling their their woes. You remember, he, he not only suffered for our, our sins, but he's, he's, he's experienced our, uh, our sadnesses, our difficulties. And I, I don't, I am, I'm not there yet, but at, at, the, at the moments that I'm most like that, it's, 
It's when I've been thinking, and by the way, when I don't think about the Savior for long enough, it fades a little bit. It, it, it's, it's interesting. It, I, I find myself not quite as sympathetic uh, when I uh, have not for a while thought about yeah, how nice the Savior is to, <laughs> to comfort me and uh, it makes it more personal. Now, that's just me, and that may not, and we may not even be answering your question, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you well, are, thank you. As we prepared for today, we, we thought it might take an hour to answer each question. Oh, and but we don't have an hour for And then we question. wouldn't think we had the answer at the end either <laughs> because these are wonderful questions. But Luke, has, Luke has another question for oh, us. I think we'll jump yes. over to that. Thank you so much for your thoughts on ministering. So in the April 2018 General Conference, President Nelson shared that it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. What counsel can you give us on how we can improve our prayers and receive personal revelation in the midst of life's challenges? I'd be a hypocrite if I didn't turn to them now. For this <laughs> one. Because I, I, I struggle with it. What do you think? Well, Luke, think let, me, let me ask you, what are, what are some decisions you need revelation for right now? Right now, I think knowing where to live um, after we graduate. So um, I have a small little family right now, me and my wife and our little baby we're, who's, on, who's on his way. Um, we're figuring out life and trying to figure out, you know, what's, what's the next path for us to take wow. right now. And it's, it takes a lot of listening and trying to know what will be that, that path that Heavenly Father yes. wants us to take. What do you think, President? Well, I mean, he, he said we had a devotional at the beginning of this semester on this topic. Oh, did you? We did. So you've been and, down this road. And he said that one of the answers that I feel is really important to that is a lot of listening. Um, the, the, this world is so distracting and so loud. And when we seek direction from our Heavenly Father, we know he's providing it. I think often we forget that it takes some significant effort yeah. to find that peace and that quiet and, and some significant time to listen. So for me, that's like one of the major things is to find the way to listen. You know, Luke, I, I remember when Christine was pregnant with our first child um, and, and it, so much coming at you and what do I study? Where do I work? Where do we live? Um, if you look at that talk you referenced, um, President Nelson, it, it was his first talk as the president of the church. And he introduced himself for about half the talk. And then he gave a talk about revelation for the church, revelation for our lives. And I used to think that's, that was a nice way to introduce himself. But as, as I've read and reread that talk, I realized he wasn't introducing himself. He was showing us how every step of his life, work, marriage, where to live, what to study, how to do his work well, um, whether to move back to Utah, each one of those decisions was a decision he took to the Lord and he sought revelation. And, and he gave us a guide. I'm just going to read, read from it. He gave us a guide on how to do this. This is in that talk, Revelation for the Church revelation for our lives. And I think it builds on what President Calway said. President Nelson teaches us to find a quiet place where you can go regularly. Humble yourself before God. Pour out your heart to your Heavenly Father. Turn to Him for answers and comfort. Pray in the name of Jesus Christ about your concerns, your fears, your weaknesses, yes, the very longings of your heart. And then listen, and he puts an exclamation point on the word listen. Mm -hmm. Write the thoughts that come to your mind, record your feelings, and follow through with the actions you are prompted to take. As you repeat, repeat this process day after day, month after month, you will go into, grow into the process of revelation. 
And, you know, I just think all through my life, where to live, I had that same question. What to study? Um, what town to live in? What do I do for my children? What profession do I take? What job do I accept? And Heavenly Father is going to let you have a repeated pattern of revelation. If you'll find that quiet place, go to him, and then listen and act when he tells you what to do. Thank you. Could I, could I just take on that? He, he's talking about survival coming because of revelation. It, it sounds like you'll get, survival sounds like getting through difficulty. And I think uh, one thing is uh, revelation is, is crucial for, but I think revelation is careful for warning. I think when it talks about surviving in the last days, there's a lot of lies out there, and there's a lot of terrible things going on, and uh, you, 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 there's a lot of ways to get into difficulty, way more than, than just the wrong career choice. Or it's, it's what's right and what's wrong, what's true and what's not true. And it, we're going into a time where, where Remember the scriptures say where people say what is bad is good, good is bad. Mm -hmm. And you're, we're living in a time like that way more. I'm so old you can't imagine how good the world was compared to the one of you. In, in terms of the, you know, the, the, all the things that are going on to t say this is not wrong. Mostly th about what is, people are saying that what is evil is actually good. And there's and politically across the world. And uh, my guess is being able to sense don't do something or don't believe something is more as important as is doing the right thing. You with me? And uh, I, to me at least, it, we all, you know, it's like a Rorschach blot. Anytime a prophet says something, we always, here's what we see in it. But I have to be honest, at least for me, when he used the word survive, I thought of the hazards. Uh, you know, I, to me, he wouldn't have used the word survive if it was to have a great career or to, uh, or to have a ni nice family or uh, all the things that are uh, nice. He wouldn't use survive unless it was a beak. There, there, there are pitfalls, there are, there's trouble coming and you need to have the Holy Ghost say, don't go that way, don't go this way. In, it, I have to say, uh, my guess is the Lord has most, the most important revelation he's told me is, don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> Fuloe has a question for us as well. Yeah. Uh, President Irene, what would be one of your greatest pieces of advice to students who are graduating and going home um, to their home countries with their degrees. You want me to start? You start. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's your problem. <laughs> uh, <laughs> responsibility, yeah. stewardship. Yeah, yeah. So, as I've had a chance to travel a little bit this year, uh, and have a lot of conversations with incredible leaders in the Pacific who have gotten their degrees from BYU Hawaii and done amazing things. Um, and when I, when I think of this question, I immediately think about the, what we just discussed, personal revelation. Um, President Nelson has taught us that we should let God prevail in our lives. And every single student that comes to BYU Hawaii has been given an incredible blessing incredible privilege to be trained spiritually and intellectually, uh, prepared to be a, a real leader in their families and their communities. Like, it's, it's a real thing, right? And I see it all over the world happening. And what, what I, my advice is develop your skills while you're here to listen to the will of God and be prepared to follow it. And if that means that there's gonna be a kind of a different plan than you might have thought, that's okay. If it means there's some sacrifice involved, that's okay. And, and I would assure you and anyone else who's kind of wrestling with these decisions 
that when you follow the Spirit and do what God wants you to do, that you will be happy and you'll be blessed. Um, and I, I, it's again, I've just, in these recent travels, been able to see people who are making such a big difference in the world by the decisions they've made to use their education to bless the lives, lives of others. So really follow what God wants for you and trust that. You know, follow, it's such a good question. And one of our university presidents once taught a famous proverb saying that was, we all have drunk from wells we did not dig and we've warmed ourselves from fires we did not build. And we have a responsibility to give back to what we've received. And you have a stewardship. By being a student here at BYU Hawaii, you have a stewardship. And what are you gonna do with that? When you go back uh, to wherever you end up after graduation, how are you gonna use the experiences here to give back to the church, to the Lord? And I, I really think the parable of the talents is a play here. It's, was this just for you and for your enjoyment and for a fun devotional? You got to tell your friends and, and future family, you got to attend with President Eyring? Um, or did you use this experience to become someone different? And that, if that happens the way it should, you'll be different you, the rest of your life. And you'll have a chance to give back and build others and build the church. And I just, I would be prayerful about what is the stewardship I have for this education I'm receiving? And how will I use it to bless others in my family, in the church, in the communities that I'll come back and serve in? And, but I think if we think of our education as a stewardship, not just as a gift, but as a stewardship, it will change how we consider when we leave here and what we do with our lives after. Thank you. So, do you have any very brief words on that before we yeah. move on? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would think it, you, you both, both, all of us have been talking really about the same thing. Uh, does, does each of us really have a path in mind, a preferred path uh, throughout a, li a lifetime? I and to what degree is he nudging us? Uh, and I would think, as, I, as well as I know the Savior in a way, what he's trying to do. He's trying to prepare the world and the kingdom for the coming of the Savior. This business of the gathering, for instance. And I don't know, any of us can see what role he has for us, but I think he has a role for all of us. I really do. I think that's why I believe in patriarchal blessings. I actually believe in patriarchal blessing. Uh, uh, we're not supposed to talk about him, so I won't talk about mine, but I got mine when I was 11 years old. Uh, uh, it, which is a strange thing, but it, it was my parents could get to where there was a patriarch. We, they were, patriarchs were rare, and so they, they taught me to get a patriarchal blessing. And a, a man I'd never seen before in my life, an old man, uh, put his hands on my head. I didn't even know what was going on, and, uh, and said, uh, uh, and again, we don't talk about details, but said, uh, let me tell you who you are. <laughs> Before this world, you had a, a desire to give a certain kind of service. In this case, it was peacemaking. You were one of the ones that the script, blessed are the peacemakers. And then described the settings in which I would bring harmony and peace wherever I was. And uh, it was and, and it was very specific and of what it would be like. Uh, now how can, 11 years old with billions of people, uh, how, how could, how could uh, 
the Lord know uh, some particular ways that I would, and, and it wasn't what I would do for a job. It wouldn't be where I would be. And so this business of, you say, returned, I don't know, I don't know, return to wherever he wants you. You with me? And I appreciate that so, because we, we talk about returnability. We have here for years, <laughs> for decades, about returnability and, and not wanting to have the, the people of great ability, you see, leave places where they could make a difference. And I, I understand that. But the point is, uh, there, there's a lot of other things as, as well that he may... So I just think the idea of saying, go wherever you can build the kingdom of God and where you can touch people's lives in the way the Lord is trying to touch people's lives and build the church. And that may be in, uh, maybe where you came from, it may not be. It, uh, again, I, I, would, I would think, pray hard about it. My guess is very often the Lord will say, yes, it's back where you came from. There's something you could do there and it would be best for your family, it could be. But th that's the way to pray. <coughs> You know, where, where can I go to be part of what you are doing, which is to prepare the, uh, the kingdom of God for the day when the Savior will come. And, uh, and, and, and I think every one of us, uh, in, in the humblest, including people that are handicapped, including people, it's not just the, the great people, it's people. Uh, my guess is, some people that have made the most difference in preparing the kingdom and the world are humble people who don't, uh, and I don't know, wherever they go, and you all know people like that. Every place they've been, they've warmed hearts and they've, they've prepared people. And uh, when you decide what you want to do, ask what he'd like you to do. And and have enough belief in yourself to believe you really matter. <laughs> even, if you, uh, even if the world doesn't think so. In fact, I think some of the people that are the, 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 the least impressive are making the most difference. <laughs> and uh, you, can, you can do that uh, if, you, if you ask. Uh, I really believe, take a look at your patriarchal blessing. Uh, and I, you they say, oh, Brother Iring, there's nothing in my patriarchal <laughs> blessing. Yeah, well, go back and read it again. Uh, <laughs> and, and, then, and then pray about it. And, thank you. Well, that's it. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. So we are basically out of time. So we're going to jump forward. And I'll, I'll just let you know that we're going to hear, f we've had a great discussion. It's been amazing. Um, and we're going to now hear from President Eyring, and he's just going to sit here and, and address us. Uh, and after his remarks, a benediction will be offered by Ethan Mangale, a junior from here in Laie, Hawaii, majoring in business management and marketing. Um, and he served in the Arizona Phoenix mission. After the benediction, we'll all stand, and we will be led in singing Aloha Oi, and we'll remain standing uh, while our special guests depart. So, President Iring, the time's now yours. My dear brothers and sisters, whom I wish I could call by name, <laughs> the, the way the prophet did, this hour has been, for me, a, a sacred time. In, in a sacred place. I've been here often and felt that but I felt it today. Music, prayers, and testimonies of truth have opened my heart and mind to feelings and thoughts that are sacred to me. When that happens, we wonder if there is a way to bring those experiences more often and more powerfully. There are cl clues in what happened to us today. There was a faithful prayer to Heavenly Father in the sacred name of Jesus Christ for the influence of the Holy Ghost to come. Our hearts were full 
as that prayer was answered for each of us. And as we listened to those words and repeated them in our minds, the music drew our hearts to the Savior. In the words of testimony, of song, of story, we have heard and felt words as if they were the words of the Lord. The Lord himself has said, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. This place and this time have become sacred for us. Our hearts and minds have been lifted above mortal concerns. Other thoughts may be occupying our attention, such as an upcoming exam or concerns for your family. The test for each of us, myself included, is to give our hearts to the Lord as we meet and fulfill our obligations. The Lord has given us the comforting and kind counsel we need to encourage us. I'll quote. And now, for the sake of these things which I have spoken unto you, that is, for the sake of returning, retaining a remission of your sins from day to day, that you may walk guiltless before God, <coughs> I would you, you should impart of your substance to the poor, every man according to that which he hath, such as feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, and administering to their relief, both spiritually and temporally, according to their wants. And see that all these things are done in wisdom and order, for it is not requisite that a man or a woman should run faster than he has strength. And again, it is expedient that he should be diligent that thereby he might win the prize. Wherefore, all things must be done in order. And I would that you should remember that whosoever among you borroweth of his neighbor should return the thing that he borroweth, according as he doth agree, or else thou shalt commit sin, and perhaps thou shalt cause thy neighbor to commit sin also. Now, and finally, I cannot tell you all the things whereby you may commit sin, for there are diverse ways and means, even so many that I cannot number them. But this much I can tell you, that if you do not watch yourselves and your thoughts and your words and your deeds and observe the commandments of God, and continue in the faith of what you have heard concerning the coming of our Lord, even into the end of your lives, you must perish. And now, O oh man, remember and perish not." Close quote. Now those last three verses should always be read after what comes before them. This is a message to people like you who have qualified for the Holy Ghost as a personal companion because of their faith and repentance. It is that gift which President Russell M. Nelson has said you will need to have for you to survive in the last days. I have felt today and in many times I have come to this place that people here have lived to qualify for that gift. That is why it feels to me as if I am in a sacred time and in a sacred place. The feeling in this place must draw from us a deep gratitude for those who came before us. Many of you know far better than I what transpired in the past and what you need to do to leave that gift for those who will follow you here. When we think of sacred times and places, I remember standing with President Thomas S. Monson 
as he rededicated the temple here. In his prayer, he expressed gratitude for the inspiration of President Joseph F. Smith, as well as for others who served faithfully and worked tirelessly so that a house of the Lord could be built here. In a history written of Laia, Hawaii, it is recorded that BYU Hawaii students made great contributions to temple work as temple workers and patrons. Here's a quotation. When BYU Hawaii President Stephen C. Wheelwright asked President Kanakawa if many students attended the temple, the latter confirmed that was so, but added that more students could serve as ordinance workers, normally a six-hour shift. President Wheelwright expressed concern that school demands combined with work and family obligations made such a time commitment to the temple untenable for most students. As they continued to discuss the matter, President Kenikawa asked, what if we have the students serve for three hours? Thus a half shift would cr be created to further extend the opportunity for BYU Hawaii students to serve as temple ordinance workers. Echoing the sentiment of previous temple administrations, the temple president affirmed the value of those students to the work in the Laia Hawaii Temple and added, they're amazing, they're bright, they're smart. They know they have a great, they have a great spirit about them, close quote. While that report speaks of the contribution of the students to the work of the Lord, I think of the example and the added spiritual contribution those student temple workers made in their families through the generations and in the kingdom across the world. Beyond that example of faith and perhaps not seen at the time, they taught a lesson of courage and confidence it took time from their studies to serve the Lord, believing the Lord would somehow compensate and multiply their powers. I know for myself that they were inspired to trust the Lord. When I was a student in my 20s, I was asked to be the first counselor in the Boston, <coughs> the Boston district in Massachusetts. It required traveling across New England every weekend when other students were studying. My t roommates couldn't believe that I would be so foolish. I did the same thing when I was a teacher at Stanford University, where I served for three years as a bishop. The other professors thought I was unwise, but trusting in the Lord, I found what you will find wherever you go and whatever you do. All sacrifice is for him. The Lord said, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the fields, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts, close quote. Now my promise to you is that you will be blessed with courage and confidence as you exercise the faith and pray what will you have me do? Listen for an answer and then do it. When he asks you, he already knows and wants what is best for you. Trust him. My father was a great scientist. He lectured and taught all over the world in every place he went. He found the tiny branches of the church if even a few asked him to speak, 
He joyfully accepted. Do you think his career suffered? Surely God poured out spiritual blessings on him and on those he served, including his wife and family. Now my testimony to you is that you are a spirit child of your heavenly father. He loves you more than you can comprehend. Jesus Christ is the only begotten of the Father. He paid the price of your sins. He did that personally for, for you. He knows you. He knows your name. You have taken his name upon you in a covenant you made as you were baptized by authority. I testify that this is true. Jesus is the Christ, the living Christ. He is your savior and mine. The Holy Ghost is a member of the Godhead. If you have listened carefully, you have heard his voice confirm truth today. I have felt the savior's love for you. He invites you to come unto him and to stay. I am grateful beyond my power of expression to have been in this sacred time and sacred place with you today. I pray that we'll meet again in such circumstances and in such places. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this special opportunity that we've had to hear from one of thine apostles, even President Eyring. We're grateful to have heard his uplifting stories and messages, as well as felt of his loving spirit. We're also grateful for our prophet, President Nelson, who holds the priesthood keys for the restored Church of Jesus Christ. We're grateful for the ongoing restoration, as well as for personal revelation. We're especially grateful for our Savior Jesus Christ, whose sacrifice makes it possible for us to change, repent, and return to live with thee. We pray for everyone in attendance here that they may carry the spirit with, with them. Please help us to feel inspired to always remember our Savior Jesus Christ so that we may have his spirit to be with us. Please um, continue to be with President Eyring and his travels, as well as we pray for safety in the travels of everyone in attendance here. We say these things humbly and gratefully in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.